House file number 495, number one on the calendar for the day, an act relating to housing. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Noor, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. House file 495 is about fairness and equity in, in the landlord-tenant relationship. Madam Speaker, this is about consumer protection. This bill ensures that when somebody leases an apartment, that you will put the apartment number on the lease. Madam Speaker and members, many individuals in my district and throughout the state are being asked to sign a lease for something that they don't know what they're signing for and being taken advantage by landlords who don't want to give them what they have asked to pay for. So this requires that a unit to be identified on the front page so that you know what you are paying for. The second issue that we are trying to fix is when you sign a lease that you have signed for a full month does not mean that you're going to be vacating the apartment two weeks or three weeks prior to the end of that lease. We have seen many instances that is the vacation of an apartment is in the 20th page or the fifth page and many individuals who have signed the lease are rendered homeless, that they cannot continue to reside on an apartment that they paid for. This ensures that we're having an equal playing field whereby when there is a notice on a period of two months for the landlord, then the tenant also gets two months of that period. We cannot allow a landlord who will take advantage of individuals who are paying and making sure that they, they do have an equal protection under the law. This ensures that two months means two months. If it's good for the landlord, it's good for the tenant. Finally, we're removing a small error in the law whereby there's a double T instead of one T for the word later. We are also removing the exception that giving a waiver under this provision. Madam Speaker, this is again about fairness, equity, and protection for the tenants, and I urge for your support. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Nor moves to amend House Law number 495 as follows. The amendment is coded A9. Representative Noor. Madam Speaker, this amendment reflects on the conversation that we've had with many stakeholders, and including from Representative Peggy Scott, that I promised that I will include this to make sure that the bill uh, addresses the day of the final enactment that includes uh, that uh, applies to leases entered into or renewed on or after that date. So this makes a correction and removes the ambiguity in the law, making sure that everything that we've talked about with all the stakeholders, that we will apply an equal uh, lease time according to Chapter 5 or 4B. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Discussion to the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. <clears throat> There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Munson moves to amend House Law number 495 as amended as follows, and the amendment is coded A19-0129. The member from Blue Earth, Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I rise today because I am very concerned about lowering the cost of rent for many of the uh, units here in Minnesota. We have a housing committee where we hear bills about how we can lower the cost of rent and make things more affordable for people in Minnesota because we have a housing shortage. And yet this bill directly will raise the cost of rent in Minnesota. This bill will make less rentals available in Minnesota because it changes the notification period, it does a lot of different things in this bill, and it takes the tools away from landlords to allow them to lower the cost of rent for tenants. And this, this first amendment that I'm introducing, the uh, 129 amendment, would delete section three of the bill, which is on page two of the bill. And this has to do with the time period that 
tenants have to give notice to the landlord. So uh, I moved to the University of Minnesota when I was 17 years old and I got a job managing a 22 unit apartment building on campus. Not managing it the first year, I was taking, doing all the maintenance. But the second year, when I was 18, I was in charge of managing this building. And at the University of Minnesota, what Representative Norr failed to mention is that right around this, the university, there is a major shortage of housing. In fact, all of the rentals at the U start on September 1st and go to September 1st the next year. And that means, and because there's such a shortage of housing, almost all of the rentals have already been signed for lease for September, January and February of this year. And when you're managing a large building, and you know that the people that you've, you've approached and they don't want to renew their lease, as a landlord, you don't know what, the, what condition the property is going to be in in August when that tenant moves out. And so because you don't know what condition the property's in, you can't guarantee that it's going to be ready for move-in on September 1st. And when there's large apartment buildings that have the same two-bedroom style apartment, same square footage, and you sign a lease with a tenant, you should be allowed to, 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 to lease them a property where they know it's a two-bedroom unit, but they don't know the exact apartment number. Because you can't guarantee nine months ahead of time that that place isn't going to have to have the carpeting fixed, uh, painted. We don't know how much work is going to have to go into that unit. And in order to keep the property cost low, we allow some flexibility in this. And this is a negotiation between the tenant and the landlord. When you're going to school at the University of Minnesota, you're not just, you don't just learn stuff in college, but you learn stuff in real life. And part of that is when you're 18 years old and you sign a lease, that you have to, learn, you have to read the lease and understand what the lease says. And in order to lower the cost of rent, landlords should be allowed to have this tool, this ability to, to lease out property units and, and lease out 80% of the units for September 1st, knowing that they, they, they know those will be ready. And for the other units, they might have to sit empty for the entire month of September so that they can paint and carpet and do all this other maintenance on the property so that we create safe housing for students. So this bill, members, delete section three, which is the, the time period to notice or quit uh, for rent. I'm sorry, this, I'm sorry, hang on one second. I got my amendments messed up here. This section for notice, well, now that I uh, got to tell you about the first part of the bill that I didn't like, this, this period uh, has to do with the, uh, uh, the notice period to quit. One of the things that's really important when you're uh, leasing an apartment is after your tenants have been there for a year, a lot of them go on to a month-to-month -month lease, or you ask them to sign another one-year lease. Now, when the housing market's doing really well, and uh, the economy's doing really well, a lot of tenants like to buy houses. And when tenants come to me and they say, look, I don't want to sign a year lease, but I'd like to stop sh start shopping for a house, can I go month-to-month? And normally, when, when landlords change their leases to go on a month-to-month -month term, they have to increase the cost of rent because the risk to the landlord of having a vacant unit is higher. So in order to keep the cost of rent low, landlords will ask the tenant, can you just give me a 90-day notice that you're going to move, that you're going to end your month-to-month -month lease so that I can start shopping for tenants? And during this period of time that you're month-to-month, -month, I'm going to look for a really good tenant who will stay there for a year lease. And if those terms are agreeable between the landlord and the tenant, they should be able to sign a lease that, that allows for this. But this provision in the bill says that if the landlord has a 30-day notice, that the tenant would also have a 30-day notice. And I'll be honest with you, people that are shopping for apartments with less than 30 days notice are, not the, are typically not the most organized of tenants. There's about 15% of tenants that are looking for apartments this month. The really good tenants are looking for 60, sometimes 90 days out. And those are the tenants that landlords want to find. And so it's really important that the tenant be given the option of accepting lower rent if they can take part of this risk away from landlords so that we don't have more vacancies out there. This, this amendment, section three, requires that landlords and tenants have to have the exact same notification period and this will increase the cost of rent for a lot of tenants in Minnesota. Representative Noor's bill addresses a specific issue right around the University of Minnesota. And if this is such an important issue, I would encourage him to go to the Minneapolis City Council and look at putting an ordinance in around the Marcy Holmes neighborhood around the University of Minnesota. 
but this bill will change notification periods all across the state of Minnesota. And this is an important tool that landlords use to lower rent. And so I urge members to vote yes on this amendment. And Madam Speaker, I'd, I'd ask for a roll call. Representative Munson requests a roll call. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Discussion to the amendment. Representative Noor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, just to look at the rent, how much I'm paying, and throughout the city of Minneapolis. I think the newspaper Star Tribune had a good article yesterday that many individuals are almost paying 50% of their income. This bill will not increase the rent for anyone. In fact, if it was going to increase the rent for the students, they're the ones who have been championing for this bill and many other individuals. They will not have come forward and say, we are supporting this bill. This bill is protection for them. This bill ensures the principle of mutuality. If it's good for the landlord, it's good for the tenant. So having two months to vacate the apartment and the landlord getting the two-month notice for rent increase and anything that comes under the law under this uh, section three, including the waiver, nobody should be asked, no tenant should sign a waiver for their rights that they're given under this provision. Madam Speaker, I oppose this amendment and I ask for you to vote it down. Discussion to the amendment. The member from right, Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And to the bill author and to members, we obviously know that there is partisan legislation that comes through and nonpartisan. And I would classify this as a nonpartisan bill. The intent is not to be, not the bill, the amendment, but the bill too. I, I truly believe that your bill isn't motivated by partisanship. But one of the things that I have a huge concern on are your comments that you just said is that this bill won't raise rents. And I just want to repeat something I said in Judiciary Committee when the bill was before us. The fact is, it will have the result of raising rent. I too read the article that you, you cited in the Star Tribune over the weekend. There is an affordable housing problem right now. There are many good people that are trying to find good places to live. And the bill author just made the comment, what's good for the landlord should be good for the tenant. But in the landlord-tenant relationship, please understand this non partisan truth that the landlord has a greater stake, more skin in the game in terms of maintaining the bottom line than the tenant does. The landlord has more risk involved when it comes to managing, maintaining, and renting housing. And the reason that it's the, the parity is different in allowing the landlord greater time frame is what Representative Munson, Munson had mentioned. Out of a 12-month calendar year, members, it may take 11 months just to cover the costs of principal, interest, property tax, and insurance and only one month out of 12 might be the profit for that landlord on that rental unit. And so by taking away, eliminating the flexibility that a landlord, the, the lead time that I would have as a landlord to know that my, my tenant is going to be leaving, if I cannot find a replacement tenant in sufficient time, I might lose money. And if I lose money for a long enough period of time, I'm going to have to do what? I'm going to have to raise rent in order to cover my costs, my increased risk. The way that a landlord calculates the rent is simply, are all of the costs covered? Then what is the potential risk for unforeseen circumstances that would create an unforeseen, unanticipated cost. I need to anticipate those. Therein lies my risk. And then I need to determine the rent I'm going to charge. 
and by shortening the amount of time that I have to find a replacement tenant means my risk increases. When my risk increases, my rent goes up. So Representative Norwell, I believe you had a good faith effort. You are 100% wrong that this will not result in a long-term ever increasing of the rents across Minnesota. The other thing that makes me highly <laughs> disturbed by this bill is this was, by your predecessor, this bill was, was uh, carried last year, and the same motivation was behind it by the students on the U of M campus to come forward and was pushing this issue. This is a very narrow issue for a very specific type of housing, student housing on the University of Minnesota campus. But what the bill is doing is applying this to all housing across the entire state of Minnesota. And I can tell you as a landlord, the risks that I have to deal with, the challenges that I deal with in different types of housing are different. If I'm renting a single room within a, a, a building versus renting a duplex, versus renting an entirety of a single family home, versus renting a, an apartment in a fourplex or in a 12plex or something much larger, there are different challenges. And I'm not sure why the bill author was not receptive to the reality on the non, again, nonpartisan reality that different types of units have different challenges. Why is there a failure to recognize this nonpartisan truth? And it would have been my desire that the bill author would have been receptive to incorporating some of these nonpartisan ideas so that we can ensure that the great residents of Minnesota are not going to see the continual rent increase members. We can work on this issue with not taking a hammer, or I should say maybe an axe, when a scalpel would be more appropriate. And so members, I would highly encourage you to recognize this nonpartisan truth and please support the Munson Amendment. Thank you. Further discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 55 ayes and 72 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Munson moves to amend House File number 495 as amended. The amendment is coded A19-0143. Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I'm disappointed that we're raising the cost of rent on tenants in Minnesota. I, uh, I, I, really, I really thought we could uh, understand that this, is, this shouldn't just be a bill brought forward by lobbyists, that we should actually be discussing this. We had a healthy debate in committee uh, I was able to stop one amendment that would have actually applied this to existing leases, and that was really uh, was really a scary amendment. This amendment, members, uh, I, this this admits that I that the notice for raising someone's rent actually should be the same from landlords and tenants. I understand Representative Nor's issue where tenants are upset that the landlord can raise the raise the rent with only 30 days, but yet. Upon receiving that notice, I can't decide I'm going to move out because the notification period might be 60 days. So this amendment allows the provision in this bill to be about raising rent and making sure that there's parity between landlord and tenants on the amount of time required for raising the rent. But it removes this provision that, that, that tenants and landlords should not be able to negotiate terms of a private contract that allow the landlord to lower the rent 
if the tenant will give them more notice. This provision is really important, and I, I don't think that people are paying attention to how much landlords use this tool to lower rent in Minnesota. As Representative Lacero mentioned, when you increase the amount of vacancies in property in Minnesota, two things happen. You have, re you have less rentals on the market, and the cost of that rental goes up by at least 9%, which is the cost of having a vacant month, just one month spread over the other 11 months of that rent. So if you don't adopt this amendment today, you will be directly raising the cost of rent. As a landlord, for the last 25 years, I have worked diligently to make reasonable accommodation to tenants with special needs, people that are going through a divorce, people that come here and they don't know if their job is going to be permanent, and so they're afraid to sign a one-year lease, but they want to do a month-to-month -month lease and can give me 90 days notice. I can lower the cost of rent. I will take tenants who don't meet that perfect, uh, perfect tenant. And I will be, in, 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 as we talked about in committee, a lot of landlords do this, but there are some bad actors in Representative Noor's district that are not doing this, that are, that are using this for a disadvantage. But the overwhelming majority of landlords in the state are working hard to fill their properties and make their, make their rent affordable. And if you do not accept this amendment today, you'll be raising the cost of rent. And that's really a concern. Private contracts are one of the things that make America great, that we can actually negotiate a private contract that's, that works out terms for both tenants and landlords. And this removes a major tool that we have for making rent more affordable. So, Madam Speaker, uh, I would ask for a roll call on this vote as, on this vote as well. Representative Munson requests a roll call. Are there 15 hands? There are 15 hands. There will be a roll call. Discussion to the amendment. Representative Noor. Madam Speaker, similar to the other argument, I oppose this amendment, and it does not do well for what we intend to do. So thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Discussion to the amendment. Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 53 ayes and 73 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Munson moves to amend House Law number 495 as amended. The amendment is coded A19-0316. Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Third time is definitely going to be a charm here. I can feel it. So this bill gives Representative Noor uh, everything he wants here, except if a tenant and a landlord want to agree in writing that this flexibility should be allowed so that the landlord can lower the rent, especially when we're dealing with tenants that have special needs. They, they need an apartment that's month to month. And landlords want to give them that accommodation so long as their notification period is longer so they can look for tenants. All I'm asking here is that two private citizens be allowed to agree in writing, in a contract, in, with disclosure to the tenant so that they know what they're signing. That's all we're asking, for a private contract so that a, a landlord can make reasonable accommodation with tenants to lower the cost of rent in exchange for the tenant giving them a longer notice period because they have a special need that they're asking the landlord to meet. This provision just asks that the tenant be allowed to have this in writing and say, I agree, I agree that I, I, am, I, am, I am giving you more notice in exchange for lower rent. That's all that I'm asking. 
I, I, I'm, this, this bill is going to have a, a major change on rental in Minnesota. You're going to have more vacancies, and you're going to increase the cost of rent on tenants around the university and everywhere across Minnesota by taking this important flexibility away from landlords and tenants to negotiate a private contract. Here's big government moving in. This is where government starts creating problems, and then two, four years from now, we'll come back and, and, and wonder why we're having all these vacancies. Why is the vacancy rate going up to 7 or 8 percent in Minnesota? Why are, why are landlords having to pay more money for commercial loans for properties because they're based on your vacancy rate? Every year, I have to report to the bank what my vacancy rate is. And I don't get to have 30-year loans on properties. They come back and renegotiate that rate, and it's based on my vacancy rate. And if tenants get to give me 30 days notice on a month-to-month -month lease that they're moving out, it doesn't give me time to go find tenants to fill properties. So now you're increasing the cost of doing business in Minnesota. And guess what? Other states don't have this kind of junk in their laws. So, other st so when you have real estate investment trusts and other large investors in, in property, they're not going to invest in Minnesota. We sit in committee and hear, why are we building more affordable housing in Minnesota? And it's junk like this that's keeping people out of our state. And it's going to take people who have rental properties who decide, you know what, it's not worth it anymore. Why would I want to have all of this risk? Why would I want to keep on raising rents on my tenants to cover all these losses? So this bill simply says that you're allowing private individuals to negotiate a private lease. As long as this is called out and the tenant waives this, this ability and that they, they say that they can have a longer notice period. That's all we're asking. So please vote yes on this bill, on this amendment. Madam Speaker, I'd ask for a roll call as well. Representative Munson requests a roll call. Are there 15 hands? There are 15 hands. There will be a roll call. Representative Noor. Madam Speaker and members, a tenant should never, ever sign a waiver when it comes to leases, especially given under this provision. The tenant does not write the lease. The landlord writes the lease. So there is a balance of power whereby the landlord has got more powers over the tenant. So I ask you to vote red on this amendment. The member from Wright, Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Knorr, you're wrong. The tenant does write the lease. They are part of the negotiation process. When I put my unit up for rent, I attract a prospective tenant. And then a negotiation takes place. We negotiate the length. We negotiate the security deposit. We negotiate pets. We negotiate a tremendous number of things. Subletting, there's a number of issues that we go back and forth. And the prospective tenant has a direct hand in writing the language of the lease that we voluntarily agree to. So you're wrong. Madam Speaker, would the amendment author, Representative Munson, yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Munson, as a landlord yourself and as a former property manager, is it your understanding that under current Minnesota law that a contract such as a lease, is not legally enforceable unless the person signing the contract is at least 18 years old. Representative Munson. Representative Lucero, I'm not an attorney, but I would say yes, they have to be 18, sane, and sober. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And would the author of the amendment yield for another question? He will. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Munson, as far as you're aware, under current Minnesota law, a person who is age 18, a legal adult, are they able to make the voluntary decision to purchase tobacco products? Are they able to make the voluntary decision, this would be federal law, I suppose, to join the military, the armed forces? Would a person of 18 years old be able to voluntarily make the decision under Minnesota law to get a tattoo? 
or their ear pierced? Representative Munson. Madam Speaker, Representative Lucero, uh, I believe you're correct in all of those statements, yes. Representative Lucero. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. So what Representative Knorr is doing with the provision in this bill is saying a person doesn't have enough intelligence. In fact, his comment at the beginning of this was, where did I put it? I wrote the quote down, and now I can't find the quote. But something to the effect of people don't know what they're signing. Well, if people don't know what they're signing, then they shouldn't sign it if they're 18 years old. And what the bill author is doing with this provision is saying people don't have enough intelligence, and so of all the provisions that are contained within a lease, that this one provision, we're going to make it mandatory they cannot voluntarily waive. But they have enough intelligence to do all these other things, join the military, buy tobacco products, do many other things. They have enough intelligence to do that, but they can't, they don't have enough intelligence to do this, so we need big government nanny state to come in and say, we know better than you, and we're going to make sure that you cannot make a decision on this aspect. Members, I highly encourage a green vote on this amendment. Thank you. Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I want to respond to Representative Knorr as well when he said that you don't waive your rights or that tenants shouldn't waive their rights. And tenants waive a lot of rights when they, when they sign a lease to live in a property. They, say they, they may waive their rights to have a 200-gallon waterbed or hang a 40-pound disco ball from a ceiling. They may waive their right in my, t in my properties to have a keg at a party because I like to ban kegs around the university because it typically involves uh, parties. And so they waive a lot of rights. And the lease is actually goes through and talks about what your rights are and what you can do and what you can't do. That's the whole point in having a lease. It isn't just about how much it costs, but there's a lot of provisions that are lease in a lease that are important. And flexibility is very important. Some, some leases allow you to sublet to anybody. Some leases uh, will, 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 will ban it. And that all has to do with flexibility for the landlord and tenant. And in every provision of the lease, is a negotiation between the two. And so this lease is written between the landlord and the tenant. And yes, the landlord may prevent what their standard lease is, but the tenant might say, you know what? I, I want to give you an extra $400 a month if I can give you one day notice to move out. And that would be up to the landlord to decide if it's worth the risk or not. But this bill, this, this bill in its entirety is going to raise the cost of rent and this provision will at least maintain some decency in private contracts in allowing a landlord and tenant to negotiate a lease that's reasonable. I hear in committee a lot that we need to, we need to be careful about people that have had evictions, prior evictions. Um, we want to make sure that all people have access to affordable housing. This provision will allow landlords to be flexible, to accept people with special needs or a checkered past. And this is really an important tool for landlords to lower the cost of rent. And I'm disappointed that this bill has come forward. And I, I ask members to please accept this amendment that allows people to, to waive their rights and actually negotiate a lease that's affordable. The member from Olmsted, Representative Pearson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, would the bill author, the underlying bill author, would he yield to a question, please? He will yield. Representative Pearson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I'm just actually curious if the bill author has ever been a landlord. Representative Noor. No, Madam Speaker. I've never been a landlord. Representative Pearson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it's, it's not a requirement, of course, to be in the legislature and have been a landlord. I'm just uh, trying to get a little bit of context and experience. Um, would the bill author continue to yield? He will yield. Representative Pearson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess, just hypothetically speaking, do you think it would take, uh, do you think it'd be easier to find a tenant in 30 days or 60 days? Representative Knorr. Madam Speaker, uh, given the housing crisis that we have uh, in Minneapolis and many parts of the state, 
uh, it may even take you less time because you're giving a person a 30 days uh, for somebody to vacate and a new uh, tenant to move in. So I believe that 30 days is more than enough. But otherwise, according to this law or bill, you can give two months to vacate. And that is equal time that you're going to give to the tenant. So we're trying to create an equal playing field for the tenant and the landlord. Representative Pearson. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Speaker. And of course, uh, for not having been in the legislature very long, that was a very good non-answer to the question. Um, I, I guess I would point out to the bill author that, of course, in certain areas of the state where uh, manufacturing is maybe burned up in a small town such as St. Charles, Minnesota, and, uh, and workers have left the town because the, the main primary employer has left, that's just not the case. It could take 30, 60, 90, 120 days possibly to find it. Um, would the bill author continue to yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Pearson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, to the bill author, I'm, I'm just curious uh, whether or not he thinks that there would ever be a circumstance, under any circumstance at all, in which a tenant may actually find themselves willing and eager to take a disparity in the, uh, in the dis or excuse me, in the notices. Representative Noor. Madam Speaker, in this bill, the only waiver that we've been talking about is under the provisions under Section 3. So when we're covering the waiver is no one should sign the waiver for the period notice, and that is what we're talking about in this bill. Representative Pearson. Well, Madam Speaker, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Would they ever, would, if, the, if the bill author would continue to yield? He will yield. Representative Pearson. Madam Speaker, and, and again, to the question, again, to that waiver, would you ever contemplate a circumstance under which the tenant would actually be eager and willing to take uh, a disparity between what the landlord's disclosure period is, the 30 days, the 60 days, whatever that is, would the landlord, or would, it, would a tenant ever be at an advantage and willing and eager to take that on as a, as a better opportunity for their circumstances. Representative Noor. Madam Speaker, this is about providing an equal playing field for the landlord and the tenant. So whatever is good for the tenant is good for the landlord. Representative Pearson. Madam Speaker, I would love to get an actual answer to the question, but I'll, I'll move on. I'll actually ask the, uh, the amendment author if he would yield to a question. He will yield. Representative Pearson. Madam Speaker, and I'm sorry I didn't actually ask you ahead of time, uh, Representative Munson, but w what would a one-month period of time in vacancy equal in the cap rate on a property? Uh, in, in vert well, again, with a cap rate, that's just a percentage, but what, what, would, that, what would that percentage be on the, on the rental income for the landlord? Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Pearson, um, I, don't, I don't know what the exact numbers would be. It would vary from property to property based on all your expenses, but it could raise the cap rate from 7% to nearly 8%, or I'm sorry, uh, lower it, lower it, a percentage is a, is a, uh, for the cap rate. Representative Pearson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That's a very good on the spot for not having been prompted. I actually heard a couple other land landlords holler out 8.5% in the gallery here, which is pretty accurate. So an 8.5% loss uh, for a landlord, you know, it, it's pretty close to 10%. So I guess I, my, my point and what I would really advise the body to understand is that for every $1,000 of rent, for every $1,000 of rent, that cap rate loss essentially equates to $100 of loss for the landlord. The only way a landlord makes that up is to increase rents. There is no other pot of money. It's rent. If a tenant, I'm sorry, would the bill, would the bill underlying bill author once again yield to a question? He will, Representative Pearson. Madam Speaker, thank you so much. Just, just hypothetically speaking, if I were a, uh, 
a single father, and I was looking to rent a property in Rochester, Minnesota for $1,000. Uh, and all of a sudden, I find out this great property is available. It's near my place of work, but the rent is $1,100. The rent's $1,100, but my landlord says, you know what? If you're, a, if you're willing to allow me 60 days notice, and I only have to give you 30 days notice, I'll lower that rent to $1,000. I've been struggling to find properties for a, lot of my, uh, for a lot of my clients in the Rochester community that, that could rent for that type of money. But that real life scenario, if that were in place, Representative Noor, are you willing to remove that ability for that, for me, the potential tenant, to negotiate that term within my rent so I can get an affordable place that, that works within my budget, uh, even though I know I'm gonna stay there for over a year and I don't really care about these waiver periods. Representative Noor. Madam Speaker and members, nobody should be taking advantage of the tenant by telling them to sign a waiver that we're going to lower your rent. We have seen this many instances by, where by many people, low-income individuals, veterans, students, are being at, taken advantage of by slum lords. So this bill, by putting the non-waiver, ensures that no one will take advantage of the individuals who are in need for housing, who are in need of protection. So no, I think I believe this will ensure an equal playing field and also based on principle of mutuality, which I think the courts will always look at the face value of that lease and say, if you are the drafting landlord, then you shall get an equal period with the tenant. So that's why I, I believe that allowing somebody to have less for rent because you're going to give them a two months uh, versus one month is not a good idea. Representative Pearson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And there it is, the voice of big, big, big St. Paul government telling you meager citizens of the state of Minnesota what's best for you. If you can't afford the rent, too bad. We think you can't negotiate on your own. You are not capable and you're going to be taken advantage of no matter who you are or where you live. Madam Speaker, this is a slap in the face to all the citizens of this state. This is big government telling you you have no idea and you can't negotiate terms that are beneficial to you. Shame on anyone who says those types of comments. We have a well-educated, strong workforce. These people work hard. And in the words of a presidential candidate, the rents are just too high. This is a way to keep rents lower. This is an opportunity for landlords to make a plan. This is the opportunity to make sure those cap rates are low, vacancy rates are low. I'm sorry, we want cap rates to be high. Thank you for the smile. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Ramsey, Representative Mahoney. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And to the previous speaker, that's the same baloney that they used to keep unions out of every place they could. You're making an argument that's 150 years old and would have destroyed the middle class. Come up with a new argument. Don't use that same old, oh, we don't want anybody to tell us or help us how to do things. We're so smart. You're so smart. You can do it all yourself. You don't need collective action. Same argument was bad back then. It's bad today. The member from Hennepin, Representative Hassan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, I rise in support of this bill. And this conversation is going from we're keeping the rents high 
First is we're protecting people. Well, guess what? We can keep people safe and protect predatory practices that put them outside. I come from a district where we had 10 city, 300 members of our community were sleeping outside in the cold weather because sham landlords took advantage of things that they didn't know, put in their leases on things that they didn't know, and they ended up being evicted. Well, guess what? I was elect to protect people, to protect students, seniors, poor people, people who look like me, and people who look like all Minnesota. So this notion that we're keeping rents high is bogus. It's a false assumption that we're keeping rents high. We're not. We're protecting citizens of Minnesota, and that's what we were elected for. If you are not, shame on you. Further discussion to the amendment? Hearing none, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. I'm sorry. You The clerk will close the roll. There being 56 ayes and 71 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Munson moves to amend House File number 495 as amended. The amendment is coded A19-0317. Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, fourth time is a charm. The, this amendment simply uh, uh, goes after the first provision of this bill, which, uh, as I discussed at the very beginning when I stood up, uh, re this bill would require that the written lease has to identify the unit being rented. And uh, as I discussed earlier, around this, this is mostly an issue with large apartment buildings with high turnover in the same month. And as I discussed earlier, around the University mm -hmm. of Minnesota, I don't know how landlords are going to comply with this bill without having 100 apartments empty for the month of August and kicking all these students out onto the street early so that they can actually lease the, the right properties. When, when rental records show that 80% of the, union, the units are able to be turned or go in and, and clean up and paint and, and maybe recarpet a couple in a, in a one week period, um, this bill would require that all tenants who are signing lease, leases months in advance are given the exact unit number that they're gonna, that they're gonna lease. This, again, is a tool that tenants use, and the, the students and landlord are both aware of this. And they say, you're, you're going to rent a two-bedroom unit, but I don't know which one is going to be available because I don't know which one's going to be undamaged nine months from now. So this provision basically says, it, unless agreed to in writing, or unless waived by the tenant in writing, that the written lease has to identify the unit. And it's a simple tool, again, that landlords can use to lower the cost of rent. If every unit has to be identified, you're going to be shutting down the University of Minnesota housing and kicking everybody out, or having people move in and then go in and having to move all their furniture around a carpet around them. It just doesn't make sense, and again, it raises the cost of rent. This has nothing to do about homeless encampments or racism or discrimination. This has to do about lowering the cost of rent for people in Minnesota something that we were elected to do. And acknowledging that regulations and burdensome requirements and increasing the risk for landlords is going to raise the cost of rent. So members, I would ask you to vote on this. I'll spare you the, uh, the, 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 the difficult vote that you're gonna have to make on this one, but we can just do a voice vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Hennepin, Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, members, what we've been hearing really is a policy debate, a public policy debate about housing. 
And what's important to remember is with regard to rents and the encumbrances that you put on rental property, you're really driving the market in such a direction that you won't create more rental housing. When you don't create more rental housing, the price goes up. So the reality is that rental rates reflect the high cost of construction, and we talked about cap rates and whatnot. You know, there's, there was discussion about the 30-day, 60-day notice. What the bill author, I think, fails to understand, Madam Speaker, is that you don't just vacate a unit and then give it to somebody else. You need time to have some reclamation to that unit. Usually there's painting that has to be done. Oftentimes carpet has to be replaced. There may be repairs to have it in tip-top shape in terms of what the market will sustain for a rent like that. So that's why you have disparities between notice and disparities with regard to uh, notice to leave. Members, you've heard a vigorous debate amongst members here who are in the rental housing business, and you should be listening closely to their advice. Again, this is the hand of big government getting in the way of the free market and private sector. And I give all sorts of accolades to those members, Lucero and Pearson, Munson, you're struggling in a rental market and having the big government and the big hand of government tell you what to do. I can stand here before you members and tell you I'm an example of what is the problem. And the problem is I can't get out of rental property fast enough. I'm divesting myself as fast as I can because of the intrusions of big government. So that's what's happening. And so what do we do as a public policy? We hear it all the time in committee. We need all sorts of subsidized housing. We got to fund different uh, organizations. We ask for waivers that the private sector doesn't get, such as waiving WAC fees and SAC fees, uh, waiving the building permit fees. These are all the things that are going on in our communities in order to build affordable housing. And don't be misguided to believe for one minute with the proposed transit rail with the transit oriented development that you're going to get housing along that without further subsidies. It won't happen. There's nowhere in the country where it has happened without further subsidies. What you're doing is you're killing the private market in the rental housing industry. Go ahead. This is what's going to be all government housing for those who can't afford a home. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the amendment, the member from Hennepin, Representative Noor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As we have talked about many times, I think we have to look into what the slum loads are doing versus what the tenants are getting. Members, you need to pay attention to what's happening. Are we supporting the slum loads or are we standing with the tenants and giving them their rights? So I oppose this amendment. The member from Olmsted, Representative Pearson. I, I, I guess everybody who rents out property is a slumlord in the state of Minnesota is what that statement actually is loaded with uh, context of. Uh, would the uh, chair of the Higher Education Committee, uh, Representative Bernardi, would she yield for a question? She will yield, Thank you. And, and just quickly, I actually um, am completely curious on this. The dormitory housing, on-campus housing for almost all higher education could potentially be affected by this. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on, as to uh, whether or not you had a hearing in your committee uh, as to whether universities, state colleges, um, as students are, are coming into campus on that busy weekend, are they going to be bound by this um, um, this specific bill as well as it pertains to student housing on campus. Representative Bernardi. Um, um, Madam Speaker, we, we have had students talk about the expensive rent on campus. I would have to delve into this a little bit more to um, be able to answer your question. Representative Ma Pearson. Madam Chair, um, I guess if this didn't have a hearing in higher education, I, I would move to place this on the table until that can be addressed and that question can be answered. This would have a huge impact on state-owned institutions 
um, having to abide by this specific law and this law change. Representative Pearson, are you asking to lay this bill on the table? I, I guess I'd request that we lay the bill on the table. Can I have a motion to lay the bill on the table? Uh, and I'd like to ask for a roll call. Representative Pearson moves to lay the bill on the table. And he requests a roll call. Are there 15 hands? Give me time to count. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Since this motion is non-debatable, the clerk will take a, the roll on the motion. I can't vote. Everybody All members who desire to vote, please vote. The clerk will close the roll. There being 54 ayes and 71 nays, the motion does not prevail. To the Munson Amendment. Madam Speaker, I have the floor, correct? Uh, Representative Pearson. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I guess I'm kind of shocked. I thought I would, I was just curious what the answer to the question was, and I can't believe that we all voted, or a majority of us voted the, uh, to not table this. Um, I guess I wouldn't have mind consulting with RCTC's campus and their on-campus housing. Uh, the student housing at, at all kinds of universities uh, here in the state of Minnesota. And I, I think we could have a huge negative impact to uh, those housing circumstances, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much. Further discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The no's have it, and the amendment is not adopted. Next amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. Johnson moves to amend House Bill number 495 members, as amended. Members. And the amendment is coded HO495A11. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker, members, this bill that we're discussing today and what my amendment is for is due to an issue in a small area of the state of Minnesota, a small area of the city of Minneapolis and St. in the Twin Cities around the University of Minnesota. In all the testimony we heard in committee, it all centered around the University of Minnesota Twin City campus. Not at Bemidji State, not down at Marshall, not up at Duluth, around the University of Minnesota. I tried at, in committee to just limit it to that area as best I could. That didn't work. But what this bill is going to do, it's going to drive rent up all across the state of Minnesota. And in greater Minnesota, we have a tough time with rental facilities already. We're shorthanded. We don't have enough rent, rental, rental properties for the workforce we need. We have companies that can come in or add on and expand their businesses, and they can't even open up the expansion area because they cannot get employees that are qualified because the employees they find cannot find a place to live. In greater Minnesota, our, our re rental rates is a lot less than in down in the metro area. So, when people build rental units, it costs just as much in Blaine to build a, build a 25 unit facility as it does in Baudette. But the rate of return in Blaine more than covers the cost of construction and maintenance.
But in Baudet, it doesn't even cover the cost of building the facility. And what are we going to do? We're going to raise the cost of rental units. Make it even harder for people in greater Minnesota to find a place to live. So what this amendment does, it limits this bill to, to units of 25 rental units or more with 51% of the pop tenant rate being full-time students in one of the state university or colleges. Since the issue has always been around the college and the university, let's just keep it to that area and try to fix that area. Although, unfortunately, it's going to cost the, uh, this bill is going to cost the cost of education and to even go higher. Uh, I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Noor. Madam Speaker, I've heard many times that this bill will increase rent. I can assure you, the way the bill is written, it's not only about the University of Minnesota. It's about many places that are impacted by the same things that I've talked about. Madam Speaker and members, I oppose this amendment. Thank you so much. Representative Johnson. Members, I do ask for the roll call on this. A roll call has been requested. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. You guys are fast. <laughs> Members, this is a good amendment. Please support it. Further discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. All members who desire to vote, please vote. The clerk will close the roll. There being 52 ayes and 71 nays, the, motion, the amendment is not adopted. Seeing no further amendments at the desk, the clerk will give a bill its third reading. Third reading, House Bill number 495, third as reading. amended. Discussion. Representative Quam. Thank you, Madam Speaker and uh, members. So, will the author yield to a couple questions? He will yield. Representative Quam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, to the author, are all the solutions for Minneapolis the best solutions for the entire state of Minnesota? Representative Noor. Madam Speaker, we're talking about tenants throughout the state. It's not only about Minneapolis or St. Paul. We are here body representing the entire state. So this bill ensures that everyone is protected under the law. Representative Quam. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And, uh, if the author will continue to yield, maybe I can get to a point where he'll answer a yes he, or no. He will yield. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Are all solutions for Minneapolis the best for the state of Minnesota? I believe that the member answered the question, but we will recognize them again. Representative Noor, Noor please. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. As I answered, we're not here just to represent Minneapolis. We're here to represent the entire state of Minnesota. And we collectively act on legislation that will ha which is good for the entire state. Representative Quam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, would the author yield to a question? He will yield. Representative Quam. Why did you not make this bill and have it address the Twin City campuses 
in those areas for student housing. Rep Representative Noor. Madam C Speaker, again, this is not about the students only. It's an issue that impacts every tenant that who signs a lease not knowing, not knowing which apartment they're leasing. And by the end of the day, they end up being given a place where they never signed for. So this is making sure that if you're signing a lease, you know which unit you're renting. That's just no brainer for anyone who lives in the state of Minnesota. Representative Kwam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And this bill contains a whole lot more than that. We heard multiple amendments, but the one thing I heard was slumlords. I didn't hear affordable housing because the solution for Minneapolis is not a solution for my area, probably for a lot of our areas. One size does not fit all. And I tell you what, I think a lot of the people in my district are not evil. Evil slumlords. The painting of all renters as being evil slumlords. No, we've got a lot of people in rural Minnesota. I know a person who used to be my rep you know, in my district, is now in Representative Bennett's district. He goes around in small towns that have difficulties and problems because a lot of the housing is run down. He'll buy that housing, fix it up, and have it available so that a first-time buyer or someone that needs to rent can go in and rent. And that is a service not only to the uh, people that are renting and leasing, it's a service to those small communities that need that revitalization. I'm sure there are a lot of larger communities that have areas of their cities that need revitalization. But apparently, what is good for Minneapolis is good for the entire state. I don't think so. And apparently, you know, in your district, such evil people that are doing all the renting. They're all slumlords. They, you know, they're just bad people. Frankly, I know a lot of people in my district and in neighboring districts that aren't bad, evil people. They care about their communities. They care about the, you know, their, their tenants. And frankly, I have seen when there have been bad times, people come forward and help out their tenants, to help out the community, and these are good people. And frankly, if you want to make something to fix your districts up, then do that. But don't go and take and say the state knows best. You know, the state should write the leases, write the contracts, just fill the names in and the address and a, and a few little particulars. No. Not every situation, not every individual's needs are the same. And by restraining and confining the option to have people come together, adults, legal adults that can make decisions, come together and negotiate and find something that works for them, that's good. And frankly, that helps with affordable housing. And I hear all the time, districts all across the state, affordable housing, but one size fits all, which takes away options and negotiations, and you, it's, your bill does a whole lot more, else we wouldn't have had, what, four or five amendments to try and define options that if the le you know, person wants to lease it, says, hey, we can come to this agreement, we're adults. We come to an agreement, make a decision. No, the state knows better because we need this in Minneapolis. And I say that's the wrong approach because the whole state, all individuals are not the same. And individual freedom, we're, we're still a democracy with, uh, you know, a lot of freedoms. But individual freedom is a key component. And I've got locations 
that need to have people that want to come in and provide housing. I know a lot of cities, when I, I lived for a while in the metro, some cities you could not get an affordable house because the city had ordinances and other encumbrances that prevented an affordable house from being built. And now we want to go and extend it to rent and rental agreements. Well, frankly, options and realizing we have individual citizens with freedom of choice, that matters. At least it still does. And I'll vote red. The member from Blue Earth, Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, I, I too am going to be a no vote on this bill. It should become as no surprise. Uh, it really does raise the cost of rent, and so I have to ask if the author of the bill would yield, uh, Madam Speaker. He will yield, Representative Munson. Representative Noor, uh, you, you have a, you, you've said several times that you don't think this bill is going to increase the cost of rent, but I, I'd like to ask you uh, if you see that this bill would increase the costs for landlords. Do you see any of the, th the things that we've talked about tonight? Do you see truth in any of the, the issues that we've talked about where my tenants have, have, I've, have had some flexibility and that the options that we use to lower the cost of rent, can you see that taking those away from us would increase our costs as, as landlords? Representative Noor. Madam Speaker, Representative Munson, I don't see any place in this bill that increases the cost for the landlord. We have talked about the notice period and everything else. You can give your tenant two months notice and you can also have that two months notice. There's nothing wrong in this bill that does not allow you to negotiate on a period that is equal to what you will give to your tenant. Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, I would ask the author of the bill to yield again for another question. Um, and I'm, He will yield. Thank you. It's, it's difficult because I, I've been in real estate for 25 years since I was 18 and dealt with, I've had hundreds of tenants and have been accommodating in so many cases and Representative Pearson and others uh, that have had rental properties. We know this backwards and forwards. So perhaps I'm making too much of a reach to say, uh, right away in explaining that how it increases the cost of rent or even how it increases our costs as landlord uh, as a landlord but removing the flexibility of knowing when my tenant has bought a property and is intending to leave or if they can give me longer notice then I can give them can you at least see how this bill increases our risk of uh, that, that we're giving away that, that, that taking this, that this option away from uh, landlords would allow us to be less flexible in negotiating terms with the tenant by, it, that, the, that the tenant could lower, that we could lower the cost for tenants in exchange for them giving us longer notice. Do you see how that works? And do you see how it would, this, that your bill would increase our risk as a landlord? Representative Noor. Madam Speaker, if you look at the time period and Representative Manson, if you're going to take a one-month notice to that tenant and tell them I'm going to increase your rent, and if that is something which you negotiated that they can give you one month for them to move out, you will have increased their rent by one month by making sure that tenant pays more than what they anticipated to pay for their rent. The incomes are going down and the, inc the rents are going up and up, so by doing that, it's actually impacting the tenants more than any other person in this bill. Representative Munson. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Noor, um, I did offer an amendment that would allow you to, to bring parity for notification of rent and notification from the, from the landlord uh, or from the, from the tenant to quit, because I do think that's fair. And I did agree with your, with your argument on that, which is why I offered the amendment to continue to allow that. But, but the examples that the members here have brought forward in dealing with tenants is being able to be flexible, 
to give tenants the option of a lower rent in exchange for providing us more notice. Because after all, having our apartments filled with tenants who are paying rent is the best way that we can reduce our costs. If we have vacant properties out there, if our vacancy rate goes up, we lose money. And if our vacancy rate goes up, our interest rates for buying properties goes up. If the vacancy rate goes up, large corporations and developers and investors and real estate investment trusts will no longer do business in Minnesota if the cap rate here is decreased because the vacancy rate goes up. So do you in any way see how your bill can increase the vacancy rate in Minnesota? Are you asking the member to yield? Yes, I'm sorry, Madam Speaker. I'd ask the member to yield and answer the question. He will yield. Representative Noor. Madam Speaker, uh, Representative Munson, I don't see any provision in this bill that will increase the cost to the landlord. This is more about the tenant-landlord relationship by making sure that we've got equal playing field. Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Noor. Um, I, I, I've tried to have conversations with you and explaining to you how, how this business works. But there are, bad, there are bad landlords out there, and you can call them slumlords. But all landlords are not slumlords, like you mentioned earlier. This, this, is, uh, this bill is going to drive a lot of good landlords away from investing in real estate. There are a lot of provisions out there where the pendulum is swinging too far in the other direction, and it's increasing the cost of doing business in Minnesota, so much so that we as a body have to start subsidizing landlords to get into this business because there are less and less people willing to do it. And the cost of rent is going up as a result. There's, as Representative Pearson said, there's only one source of revenue for landlords, and that's, well, there, there, there should be only one, and that should be rent. I guess government subsidies and government handouts is another way that we can lower costs. But we shouldn't be doing that. We should be paying attention to the people in this room as well that, that have, have had experience in renting properties and understand the flexible tools that we use to lower the cost of rent. Like somebody who wants to buy a house, somebody who's going through a divorce, or in the, in the first provision in your bill, as I explained earlier, where there's 30 units coming up for availability, but I know that at least a few of them need to have work done on them, and I don't know which ones they're going to be. So if I approach somebody at a homeless encampment and said, how would you like to have half price rent in this unit come September 1st, but I don't know which unit it's going to be, but I'll give you half the, I mean, you can have half, half rent because I need it filled by someone. And by the way, I'm going to give you 30 days notice so that you have to vacate because I'm giving you half rent or you can pay full rent, but that's the deal. It's being in a homeless encampment or having in a very affordable uh, apartment because I don't know which apartment's going to be available. And I just want to have somebody filling it and giving me something. That should be a tool that landlords can use to be flexible in creating leases for tenant. This is how we can lower the cost of rent. Give people flexibility. Give two adults the ability to negotiate a private contract. As Representative Quam pointed out, this is one step further to the government just writing the leases for us. Fill in the blank. Connect the dots. Give a box of crayons to kids and let them fill in a lease and college campuses like they apply for credit cards. Students are getting in trouble applying for credit cards too because they're 18 years old and they're, they get a free Big Mac if they sign up for a credit card at a McDonald's. People need to learn how to take accountability for their actions. They need to learn how to read leases and read the small print. It's part of becoming an adult. But this, these provisions that apply to the University of Minnesota for you apply to all of Minnesota in my district where we are flexible, we have, I have a rural farm site that I rent out on several acres and there's nobody that wants to move into a farm site in January. So my tenant can't move out in the winter time. That's part of the lease. We should be able to write leases that include terms that allow us to lower the cost of rent to reduce our risk. And in exchange, the tenant gets a lower rent. That's fair. You are drastically changing the rules out there with this bill to protect the lobbyists and a few people at the University of Minnesota that brought this forward to you, and it's disturbing because we have one Minnesota here. This isn't just Minneapolis expanded. 
We're trying to write legislation for one Minnesota, and we have a piece of legislation that addresses Representative Noor's district only, and we don't have problems. I don't have tenants in my district coming to me complaining about this. Representative Quam doesn't have tenants complaining about these issues. We have tenants that actually appreciate the flexibility in being able to write a contract between a tenant and a landlord. So please, members, you had an opportunity to send this back. We can vote this bill down. And I would uh, encourage a no vote on this, because voting yes is going to raise the cost of rent. And it's really disturbing. Oh, and I, I'm sorry, I have one more question for uh, Representative Knorr, if you'll yield for a question. He will yield. Representative Munson. Representative Knorr, I'm not an attorney, but I'm, I'm concerned about one provision that wasn't covered in here. Um, I have a tenant that's on a month-to-month -month lease right now, and um, under a, a written month-to-month -month lease, under the provisions, she has to give 90 days notice if she's going to quit, but I have to give her 30. So under this provision, it says that it doesn't apply to existing leases, but if it's a month-to-month -month lease, it never comes up for end. Does that mean that this, that lease can extend uh, forever under the current terms, or does, does this somehow apply because every month is a month-to-month -month renewal? Representative Noor. Madam Speaker, Representative Manson, I'm not also an attorney, but what I can tell you that there are provisions under the periodic uh, period that somebody can sign the agreement for month to month, and this addresses the lease that you have signed. And most of the leases uh, that you're signing is usually six to 12 months. So I'm not an attorney, but when you are giving month to month, it means 30 days from every month that you're going to be paying for that rent. Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, there are a lot of tenants that are on month-to-month -month leases because their one-year or six-month lease has expired, and they're good tenants. But the terms that they had signed up for allow the month-to-month -month lease to exist because they have to give the landlord more notice than the landlord uh, has to give them. And that's what allows the month-to-month -month lease to be affordable for the tenant and work out for the landlord. So. This actually is going to change a lot of leases in Minnesota. And I'm deeply concerned that it's going to raise the cost of rent. It's certainly going to raise the expenses of having a property. And uh, again, members, I would urge a, a no vote on this bill. The member from Wright, Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There's a provision on the bill, line 1.16 through line 1.20, that speaks about the lease start and end date, and if a prorated rent applies, that it must be on the first page. Madam Speaker, would the bill author yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Lucero. Uh, Madam Speaker and Representative Knorr, why are, could you just give some background why you singled out the lease start and end date and if it applies the prorated rent to put that on the first page. The author of the bill, Representative Noor. Madam Speaker, uh, this applies to when somebody moves in on the 15th of the month and they have paid for the whole month. I think you should pay for what you're getting, not what the face value of that lease should be. So by making sure that it's not in page seven or eight of that lease agreement, we want to bring it forward that you know what you're signing. We're not taking away that you're going to tell that tenant that you will be paying for 15 days versus paying for a whole month. So whenever you are moving out also, you know that you're going to stay in that apartment for 15 days rather than a month. So you are paying for that 15 days rather than what's happening right now when people are paying for a whole month and just getting 15 days or even a week. So this is why we want to make sure that it's on the front page, you know what you're paying for and how many days you're paying for your rent. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And if the bill author would yield for another question? He will yield. Representative Lucero. Uh, Madam Speaker and Representative Knorr, as far as you're aware, is there anything else in existing state law that mandates where provisions must be on leases, or would this be the first instance of a particular provision having to be on a particular page, in this case, the first page? Representative Knorr. 
Madam Speaker, uh, as someone who has seen lease agreement, I, I think there's some requirement that it has, some few things have to be on the front page, but I'm not aware of any legal process personally. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I have a copy of the lease that I use. This is a 25-page lease. I'm sorry, it's a 23-page lease. And last year, I referenced, I'll hold up just the first page here. Last year in committee, I referenced that on my first page, gen about a third of the way down or so, I have written in words under, uh, underlined, this is a legally binding contract, please read it carefully. And if you could imagine, I had a lot of white space on the top, which pushed everything else down. So members should be aware that obviously there's a lot of provisions that are contained within a lease. A few additional, in addition to the start, end date, and prorated if it applies, there's the amount of rent that would be paid. The method of payment, is it a check or is it electronic? That has to be included. That's important for tenants to know. The security deposit, is there a late fee? What is a late fee? When would the late fee apply? Are pets allowed? Is there a pet deposit? Use of a premises, how can it be used? Is subletting permitted? Condition of the premise, premises. Who would be responsible for what kinds of repairs? Alterations, is a tenant allowed or permitted to make alterations? Can they hang pictures? Can they put holes in the wall for window treatments? Utilities, who is responsible for which utility? Is the landlord paying for the garbage and the heat? or all utilities or no utilities? The right of the landlord for entry. Does the landlord have to give a notice? If so, how long? An hour notice, four hour notice. Smoking policy and the background authorization check. There are many important provisions, but none of them, at least as far as the bill author just said, he's aware are mandated on any particular page. The first couple pages of my lease are a definition of terms. And so now what's going to happen is, it is complete, it is absurd that of all the important provisions, let's just pick rent, the amount of rent can be on page nine, but if it's a prorated amount, that has to be on page one. And that interrupts the natural flow, then, of definition of terms. This is what Representative Quam was referring to, one size fits all. This is a way of micromanaging. I truly wish, and I'm emphasizing Representative Knorr, both in committee, and I'm saying it again on the floor, the issue that you're trying to address here, I tr it's not partisan. And I truly wanted to work with you. But there's been an outright rejection of any ideas. We can solve the specific issue that you're trying to address without what's happening here. Please, members, understand. Just this one example, that this provision on the front page doesn't make any sense. I mentioned in my comments earlier that there are different types of uh, rental units all across the state. There are also different types of tenants. My understanding of the roots of this bill, the origins, is dealing with students and student housing. But students, that's one type of tenant. Somebody who's recently turned age 18 and they're looking for student housing. But there are many tenants, types of people, in many different stages of life. Uh, I think it was Representative Pearson who mentioned a divorced dad. What this bill is going to do, it's going to contribute to small landlords, because of the in, they cannot cover their risks, uncertainty is the enemy of business. The greater the uncertainty, the greater the risk, and therefore the greater the cost. And so what any business owner wants to do is have more certainty 
so that they can greater project into the future and therefore lower costs. And because there are many landlords out there that are small business owners, they might just have one rental unit. They might be renting just their basement. And then you have the range all the way up to large companies with many properties across the state, multi-state companies with many properties across the country. Those larger landlords, they have the ability to mitigate their risk by spreading it across a larger area. But as Representative Hurtas pointed out, the smaller landlords, the cost and the risk will be too great that they won't just raise the rent, they'll just step out of the business. And when you have less supply but more demand, the law of supply and demand dictates what? Price goes up for the remaining that are offering the product. And so the customers, the tenants in this case, are going to pay more. I, it is just, it's so frustrating, Representative Knorr, that there's just an outright rejection of these other ideas or the willingness to, the line of questioning that Representative Munson was asking you, the willingness to accept that landlords under your bill are going to have a greater risk, they're going to have a greater cost, or that rents would go up. You said no to all th three of those, or you danced around the question. An un complete unwillingness to see through the lens of the small landlords how you and your, I should say, not you, Point your language. Order. Madam Speaker. Representative Becker Finn, for what purpose do you rise? Point of order. State your point of order. It is uh, Mason's 124. It is not the person, but the measure that is the subject of the debate. Thank you, Representative Becker Finn. Just remind the body to uh, keep the discussion to the subject at hand. Thank you. Representative uh, Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Becker Finn. It is not Representative Knorr that's at issue. I appreciate that reminder. It is the bill language. Representative Knorr, it is deeply frustrating that the bill language fails to incorporate any of the ideas in here from other members on this side of the aisle or from small business owners of the reality of what's going to happen as a result of this. Increased risk, increased landlord expense, and increased passing those on to the tenant in increased rent. Uh, Representative Pearson was asking Chair Bernardi earlier if this bill was heard in the Higher Ed Committee. As a member of Higher Ed Committee, I see Representative Pearson is no longer on the floor. The answer is no. Despite the fact that this bill is going to have a significant impact on student housing, on college campuses across the state, this bill was not heard in the Higher Ed Committee. So as a result of landlords stepping out and no longer offering their properties for rent, what are we seeing being constructed in the apartment or rental space? Workforce housing. What is workforce housing? Workforce housing is the admission that rent is too high and that government will subsidize a portion of the rent so that the landlord can charge a lower rent to the tenant. Members, that is the direct result of a shortage of rental units or landlords that choose not to rent, is that it's the companies that come in and provide the workforce housing to subsidize the rent, and what does that do? It creates certainty because now the landlords have certainty. And because of that greater certainty of government subsidizing the rent, they can charge a lower rent. I truly wish we could have worked together to come up with something to solve the scenario that's experienced in a small area of the state by a, a small type, uh, a single type of tenant. Instead of blowing this open to the entire state, instead of uh, one-size-fits-all to all rental units and rental types. And I'll end with this. 
Madam Speaker, Representative Munson spoke about the flexibility. These larger companies, do you know the criteria that they use for the rental screening? They have the policies across the board. One of the policies, for example, it's a very typical policy that you must have a third, no, the rent can be no greater than a third of your gross income. Well, I as a landlord, I have a more lenient policy because I have the flexibility in my tool set to be able to negotiate that. Because members, through, with this last great recession, there are really good people, really good people that lost their homes and were foreclosed on. They went through bankruptcy. And you know what I did as a landlord? I helped those people because the one-size-fits-all policies of the larger landlord companies, they would not have qualified. But I, as a smaller landlord with greater flexibility and a tool set that allowed me to shuffle things around, allowed them, I, there was a point when every single one of my tenants had either gone through a foreclosure or bankruptcy, and they had destroyed credit. How do you think I made up for the increased risk that I, as a landlord, would be incurring by renting to them at the risk of them unable to pay the rent? We, sh we voluntarily negotiated some other aspects of the lease to accommodate their situation. That's why having a flexible tool set is very important. But when you remove the tool set, Good people are going to get hurt, and I am so happy, and the smiles and actually the tears on some of my tenants, they cried because I was willing, tears of joy, willing to rent them good housing when nobody else would accept them. And so we've heard the term slumlord, and it is deeply offensive. Madam Speaker and the great residents of Minnesota, we've heard the term uh, slumlord. And for tenants all across Minnesota and for you landlords, small and large, that are willing to rent to the great residents of Minnesota, thank you. You're not slumlords. And unfortunately, we're creating policy based on a very, very small percentage of bad people that inflict pain and take advantage of others. But the truth is, we know the truth, that landlords love their tenants and want to help, and that flexibility allows us to help them. So, Madam Speaker, I would highly encourage a red vote on this so that we can come back together and incorporate some of these other important ideas so we can solve the problem, but not increase rent across Minnesota. Thank you. The member from Anoka, Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Knorr, for bringing this bill. And um, I was uh, the chair of the committee that heard it last, last year when it came about. And, and the students down at the, near the university, in some cases, really are in a pickle in many cases. And I appreciate um, you um, making the changes for the effective date and, and making sure that that didn't conflict with, can conflict with current leases. But I do have, um, my major concern with this is the flexibility issue. And members, um, most of you know we own um, some rental property. And one of the things that we are able to do is negotiate with people um, when they have run into hard times. And so I'm afraid that, for instance, under this bill, if a tenant came to me and said, um, you know, I've lost my job and I'm going to have to move back in with my parents or a relative or something, um, the, the, that, the, the 60 day, if, if it's a 60 day time period that we have for notification, <clears throat> that they're going to have to fulfill that lease for the next 60 days. Whereas in the past, what my husband and I have done is said, hey, let's, we'll work with you. If we can get it rented out before that, we'll waive that 60 day notification period for you. 
And you're taking away with this bill, you're taking away that flexibility um, for people to act in good faith and help one another out. And um, I really would prefer, Representative Knorr, if this bill did apply just to university housing or if some of the language were tightened up so that it would only affect um, those certain situations where there's a problem. Um, thank you, members. I encourage a no vote. Further discussion to the bill? Is there anybody who wishes to speak who has not yet spoken on the bill? Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, Representative Lacero brought up a very interesting point on the lease duration notice. Um, because I think the terms of the lease are always first, so that everything below is defined by those terms. And uh, I've also realized that many, uh, many times I will write an amendment to the lease. Instead of writing a whole 25-page lease, we just change one term of the lease. And uh, changing a term of a lease, maybe that's where you rent out an apartment uh, for one unit and they change their mind and they, they find another roommate and they want to have the three-bedroom unit. Well, that goes on the amendment, but that's not on the first page of the lease. And I, I think that this, that this bill needs work. And so, Madam Speaker, I, I would make a motion to refer this to the Ways and Means Committee so that it can go back through housing where we can actually work on some of these provisions of this bill that need work so that we're not uh, directly raising the cost of rent in Minnesota. Representative Munson moves to re-refer House File 495 to the Committee on Ways and Means. Discussion. Representative Winkler. Members, please vote no. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The motion does not prevail. To the bill. Further discussion, members? S Representative Noor. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. This is about fairness. This is about equity. This is about consumer protection. And I'm asking for your support for this bill. It's not only about the University of Minnesota. It's not only about Minneapolis or St. Paul. This is for every tenant and this is about the principle of mutuality based on the common law principles. This allows for people to have equality under that provision under the agreement. So I ask for your support. Thank you so much. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. The clerk will close the roll. There being 71 ayes and 53 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to.